The morning is um, often delayed or start in a workshop by having to go out to prune flowers. And, <laughs> and dreadful temptations, dreadful, dreadful temptations. But so is gardening another passion? Gardening is passion, And the vegetables are the root to my stomach. <laughs> I'm driven by my stomach. <laughs> so what's happening here? Oh, this is um, wedging clay, mixing two different pieces of, uh, two de different densities of clay together. And by sandwiching them, by simply snapping them together, you're putting a layer. So I doubled it. Every time I cut it and stack it, I double it. So if I do that 20 times, just think on this. 20 slices, 20 times I do that, I double it. How many slices have I got? Would you believe it? It's 1,048,576. And more and more, as uh, I get more and more involved in the way I work, the quality and condition of the clay is of more and more importance. There we go. If we can see very light striations through it, we know that we're very close to mixed. I know we're short on soup bowls. Kneading, again, very good, great similarities. And what we're doing here is the same as kneading bread. It's mixing and expelling air. And many, many potters over the years have also baked bread. Soup bowls. Make them eight and a quarter. That's what we're looking for. Lump of clay that size. It's probably true that most craftsmen in Britain have a radio right beside them all the time and work in a, a real snug of a workshop. I don't mind if I don't touch wet clay for months on end, but I want to be making and venting. It's nice working in the summer when the air is warm and the water is warm. In the winter, it does require a bucket of warm water just to keep going. I started out in the life with the best intentions of being an architect, but I was academically really um, unsuited. I didn't pass exams. I wanted to be making, I wanted to be doing things. And right from the age of seven or eight, uh, I was given a set of tools. My mother recognised that I was a, a keen maker. There we go. And I had a small workshop at home and always wanted to invent and make. And it was purely by chance that some friends pointed me towards pottery. I had, in fact, had a great passion at school for geology. I thought that was great fun. And the combination of using earth minerals and making things. And did you? Well, I, I, I'm not at school. It was only when I ran away from home to go and seek my fortune in the world that I, that I met Clay. Most of the innovations, um, as many have said before, uh, go on in small sheds and small workshops. It's the hand makers, the innovators, um, who, who come up with the new ideas because we've got no tooling up costs. Th those hands, that, that's the only tools that we really need. And so we can change, I can change the shape of this bowl at will. And I will, let's make French onion soup. There you are. Change that, that's going to be. Well, I guarantee you that your onion soup will taste better in that shape than in the first one. Why is that? I don't know. What I want to show you is why I'm making these pots and the, and the technique I use. Uh, salt glaze, I mean, that's the, well, the, the, the method I work. And everyone, every one of us craftsmen, every pot has got a different uh, technique they use. Salt glaze generates this orange peel texture. You've got lovely breaking on lines so that these lines are incised in the pots, all the edges break, so it gives you these yummy textures. Salt glaze is very, very much about textures. Now come over here and look at this. This is absolutely classic brown orange peel. Nutty browns, silky, the iron speckle, little iron pyrites in the clay, um, generates these lovely, lovely little spots. Now I will employ the same thing on doing 
big, lavish, silly. Uh, no, big and lavish and silly it may be, but this, this big fish dish, I want it to be used. I still want that to inspire people to fill it. Fruit de mer, uh, a big sort of seafood salad, uh, maybe not at this scale, but a couple of lobsters would go down very nicely in there. Now, if it will inspire people to do that, then as a, as a maker, I really have achieved something. I don't want them behind glass, I want them used. No, that's full of food. No, there's a banquet. These are known in this institution as wicked little sauce boats. And they are exclusively for wicked little sauces. I want something jaunty that will inspire you. Even if it's just a slip, if you're putting tomato ketchup into this little baby, why not? Tomato ketchup in there becomes banquet food. It's not just red splodge. And that's the way, that's what I see the pots doing. And there's no reason why we can't invent everything. I've got plates for stroke victims where I've made a self-loading plate. A plate which, when you use a fork, so somebody who's single-handed can chase the food around, it meets a lip, just like this one, an over a turned in lip, and it's much easier for them to eat. And given enough weight that it doesn't push around the table. Now, that again is because we've got the freedom of our hands to hand make and to get anything. Um, we can invent it there and then on the day. If I'm playing something silly, like doing this salmon dish, then we're actually in size positive texture and then let the salt melt break the edges and just show all the scales this is the nearest i get to art where i'm actually depicting something otherwise i'm purely a craftsman i only think of myself as a craftsman but when i did this jug this was somebody asking for a fat belly jug with a leaping fish and the reason i put a leaping fish onto the handle was sheer naughtiness i just thought it would really be a great practical joke. Is that where it started? That's okay. how it started. And as a practical joke, it was a winner. Everyone said they wanted one. And it adds character. I, I firmly believe in practical jokes and, and doing things that are silly. I once did one of these fish with just the, the bones. Head, tail and bones in between. It didn't last three months. People said it's silly and then one person walked in and said that's silly and I'm having it. <laughs> and that then leads you on to think of more possibilities and more ideas. And so I really often encourage youngsters to if you've got a silly idea, go with it. So your ideas is getting sillier, do you think? Do you think? Uh, allowing the silliness. We are mostly trained and brought up to act sensibly and do things uh, logically. Well, the logic is that if it amuses me, it'll amuse someone else. Ah, that one. Red crop. No problem. But you can also see that It's a seated bread crop. <laughs> that, that was because we needed a seat. A, a eighth person at dinner had to sit on the bread crop, and the old one had a great big knob on it. Boy, did it hurt. <laughs> These eight holes. These chaps were some waste clay that I had. I, I used to make hedgehogs for the children. And people kept asking for them and buying them if I had them around the place. So I thought I must clear up all this waste clay. So I made them into a bunch of hedgehogs. And what I am determined this time is that I'm going to have some families because I've got these little babies and i got a little baby and a little baby brother and a mummy and daddy and I will sell them as a group to go into someone's garden. I believe that those things will give huge amounts of pleasure to somebody. It'll take them more into their garden, get them more involved in the gardens and just give them a better life. Inspire them to be future potters. Yes. I I see lots of children coming through and um, they've all done a little bit of something. But once in a while, and I saw one yesterday, you see a child who is just totally engaged. And is often, as in yesterday's case, I was told by the teacher, this child had shown no interest in anything. This was the first time I just think, that's it. It was destined. There's something in there that wants to be a maker, and they can see it. And if it brings them alive, then all power to them to go ahead and do it. And that was you. It was me. I was very lucky. I was given a very good education, and I was allowed to uh, fail academically, but win on the craftsmanship. They always said, you know, great map maker, did wonderful maps, hopeless essays. I spent a fair amount of my time taking pots up to the, to the kiln, assembling them ready for firing. Never did put a door through there, but one of the bonuses is that I'm really very often seen 
by people in the village, especially chaps on the tractors coming past. And so they, they visibly see me as part of the village life. Rather than being secluded in a workshop and never coming out, I'm actually seen. Of course, the downside is that I'm very tempted to do a bit of pruning on the way back and attend to a few plants. It takes me about five weeks to make enough pot to fill the kiln and a week to pack and fire it. So I, probably speaking, work in a six-week cycle. But, you know, all the dishes that I make, I mean, you just have to see the broad beans coming on and you're just thinking of filling great dishes of broad beans and nice milky sauces, you know, it just all goes together. Every other craft, and you'll see techniques that they employ, and you'll suddenly think, I could use that. They're playing with the surface, I'm playing with the surface. They're weaving things, I can integrate things. You are not proud to be with them. So the guilt's important to you? It's very important for that. And you forget it. You forget it every year, and you're reminded every year when you get an exhibition finally mounted. And if you don't, and you end up, if you do it for enough years, you just, it's, it's in your blood. You've got to go back and see those folks. And they are your mates. We live very isolated lives. We work in our workshops. We, we, we are not out and about quite so much. And we don't meet each other, but for these exhibitions. <coughs> this is... A sentinel of the herbaceous border, not to be confused with the common garden gnome. As you will see, racy ties, kipper ties, they evolved in the late 60s, early 70s. And is there any in the garden? Yes, there are well, some. Can we, can we find one? Yeah, the coping. I did see one stomping through here. There's one. In amongst the Astrantia. And how old is that one? That one's been out here since, ooh, probably 93. It's doing well. Oh, it's perfectly happy. 